Hi, my name is Carrie Rinker. I'm going to be presenting today on how to start and grow a food and agriculture law practice. I'm going to be discussing a couple of big points today. First and foremost, what is food and agriculture law? I'm asked this question quite often when I introduce myself around here in New York City. Um, Secondly, I'm going to be talking about how to start a food and agriculture law practice for those of you that are viewing online that are interested in going this direction. Um, specifically, I'm going to be talking about my story. Um, and then third, I'm going to be talking about how to get food and agriculture clients, branding, networking, marketing, etc. I took a survey online with farmers, agribusiness owners, and food entrepreneurs about what they think about legal professionals. Um, there's some interesting results from that survey. And then finally, what are the primary legal needs of the food and agriculture industry? A little bit about me. I grew up on a beef cattle farm in central Illinois, Balin Hay, and I showing cattle through 4-H and FFA. I've got degrees in animal science and agriculture and a master's degree in beef cattle nutrition. Who knew you can get a master's degree in that? I went to law school um, around here in New York City at Pace Law School with certificates in environmental and international law. Before I started my own law practice, I worked for a law firm in Cheyenne, Wyoming, the windiest place in the whole country, um, doing environmental law, property law, land use, and federal lands litigation. And I was working for cowboys out west. It was great. Um, but at some point, I got a little homesick and I wanted to move back to New York City and also practice food and agriculture law at the same time. And the only way for me to do that was for me to hang my own shingle, which is what I did. I'm currently the chairperson of the American Bar Association General Practice Solo and Small Firm Divisions Agriculture Law Committee. And my food and agriculture client base ranges from farmers and ranchers, small to mid-sized agribusinesses, and even uh, food entrepreneurs, people making um, mustard and pickles and jams and jellies um, out of their home. First and foremost, I wanted to touch on what exactly is food and agriculture law? It's different than um, certain subject practices subject-based practice areas like real estate, um, commercial litigation, criminal law, personal injury, because it is an industry-based practice area. It touches upon nearly every single area of law. It's just geared towards the food and the agriculture industry. This is why it's difficult to market and explain to people what food and agriculture law is. Um, and, and this is also why it's very hard to be an attorney um, who does food and agriculture law because you have to know so much about so many different um, practice areas. Professor Susan Schneider from the University of Arkansas School of Law, she wrote an article about what is agriculture law. And she says that it is a study of the network of laws and policies that apply to the production, um, marketing, and sale of agriculture products. That is the food we eat, the natural fibers we wear, and increasingly the biofuels that run our vehicles. And I really like this definition a lot. Uh, she goes on and talks about different practice areas. I'm going to just touch on a few of them here in today's presentation. For example, it's contract law. Farming is a business too. Like any other kind of business, they need contracts, or at least they should have contracts, but we'll get into that in a second. Um, you know, buy-sell agreements, partnership agreements, purchase agreements, non-disclosure agreements, real estate contracts, um, non-compete clauses and employment contracts, and uh, wind energy or solar energy leases. It can also be very specific. Um, for example, next month I'll be in North Carolina speaking on agriculture production contracts and custom feeding arrangements. Uh, do you know you can have a lease for a bull or a stallion? You can. And purchase agreements for food products, um, embryo transfer contracts, farm machinery agreements, and even farm and ranch leases because in agriculture there are landlords and tenants like there are with any other kind of business industry. Business formations is also a big deal um, in agriculture. Food um, and agriculture production can be high risk 
and it's even more important for uh, farmers and agribusiness owners to think about liability protection. However, that said, uh, food and agriculture lawyers should be cognizant of federal farm program planning and succession planning, which might have different goals for the specific operation. Food and agriculture law is also estate planning. The average American farmer is about 65 years old and most have no succession or estate planning whatsoever. The problem now is with heirs getting off farm jobs. I am an heir to a farm in, in Illinois and I have an off farm job in New York City working as an attorney. So I am um, the average right now in the, um, in the agriculture community. So training those heirs to be able to manage and take over the farm and getting them interested in taking over the farm is a big concern right now. Estate tax at the federal level is at about 5.25 million, which sounds like a lot. It's not a lot in terms of agriculture, and in New York it's even lower at 1 million. And again, federal farm programs uh, can be stalled with um, when a state goes through probate, so that's why it is very critical for farms to think about succession and estate planning. It's also insurance law. Homeowners and renters insurance won't cover commercial activity from a farm. So cottage food operations, people making pickles or jam out of their kitchen, um, that activity is not covered under their homeowners or renters insurance. Um, so I recommend that those operations get commercial insurance as, as I recommend for many other food and agriculture operations. Um, products liability insurance, crop insurance, there's a whole federal program on crop insurance, uh, livestock and equine insurance, environmental insurance, and if an operation has a big e-commerce um, part of its business, even cyber insurance. So insurance review is all part of um, practicing food and agriculture law. It can also be animal law, uh, livestock animal cruelty um, with you know, perhaps in upstate New York, there are dairy operations or horse operations where there are alleged um, charges, uh, misdemeanor charges, for a failure to provide necessary um, food, water, shelter, or veterinary care. So there are attorneys that get involved in the defense of those um, types of charges. Livestock transportation laws, aquaculture, um, apiaries, which is bees, like rooftop bees here in New York City, um, farm dog law, who knew, and pet trusts or horse trusts. So there's a myriad of different animal law issues that affect agriculture. It's also intellectual property. I've been doing a lot of trademarks for, um, for farms of different sizes and also agribusinesses. Um, you know, copyrights, trademarks, and patents, which I am not patent barred, but these are all affect different segments of the food and agriculture industry. It's environmental law, concentrated animal feeding operation regulation under the Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act, um, wildlife protection on farms and ranches, and natural resource um, conservation programs. It's also land use and zoning law, Think about divisibility restrictions on farmland or density restrictions with the number of head of livestock on an acre. Um, is the land zone residential or commercial? Um, there are some specific land use and zoning concerns with urban and suburban agriculture, such as with backyard chickens, uh, apiaries again, or rooftop farming. And then we've got the New York right to farm law getting paid. Farmers and ranchers want to get paid too. So it's also pre and post judgment debt collection. In the state of New York there are a couple few uh, specific liens dealing with agriculture such as a lien on a calf or a foal from the service of a bull or a stallion. A stableman's lien. I think in the statute it's referred to the, the bay, for the bailey. And the landlord's lien on crops. Increasingly, in the last year, I've been getting a lot of questions on employment, labor, and immigration law. Uh, a lot of farms now, particularly those that are selling uh, via farmer's market or community-supported agriculture, are using volunteer labor, 
whether that be with internships, apprenticeships, or community volunteers. There are potential compliance issues with the Fair Labor Standards Act um, when dealing with um, volunteer labor. Employee and independent contractor agreements, employee handbooks, um, some farms have migrant farm workers and I-9 compliance um, issues. So the list goes on and on here, miscellaneous food issues. Um, every once in a while I do some food labeling review, deal with some food safety concerns. Um, rarely do I deal with a farm transportation law issue, but it certainly is um, something that a lot of farmers think about. Agriculture finance and sales, and there's even a, a separate chapter in the bankruptcy code that deals with farm bankruptcy. Um, as I already mentioned before, I mean, direct farm marketing um, is, in a, and I will be presenting more specifically on direct farm marketing on a future law line uh, presentation, but direct farm marketing or cottage food operations, which are home-based um, food processing, um, on-farm poultry slaughter are all some up-and-coming issues in food and agriculture law. It's criminal law. When I worked in Wyoming, um, you know, some of the ranchers, if their livestock wandered and they went on federal, federal land and they didn't have a permit, they could potentially get a criminal trespass ticket. Um, so it could be criminal law, it could be a personal injury law with farm injuries. The list goes on and on and I have a, a cake up there of people getting divorced because I do a little bit of divorce law as well, but farmers and ranchers get divorced too and you could only imagine um, the complexity in dealing with a farm family divorce um, in, this, in this situation. So nearly every area of law that you can think of touches on food and agriculture. And this is a very important point. You cannot be an expert in all these areas. I consider myself a general practitioner for the food and agriculture industry. I get questions that I don't know the answer to and I have no shame in that. I think it's okay. I can either figure it out or I can bring in somebody with more experience in those areas. There are some areas that I know a lot better than other areas, and I'm trying to get more education um, in certain areas. For example, in November, I'm attending an agriculture tax seminar um, to try to get some more help on sophisticated farm um, estate planning. My suggestion to people who want to be a food and agriculture lawyer is to know a little bit about a lot and know a lot about a little. Um, you know, what are, what are those areas that you want to concentrate in, whether that is farm estate planning, uh, food and agriculture business planning, or international food trade. Um, you need to do what makes sense for your own practice and know the people to bring in when appropriate. All right, I'm going to talk very briefly about how I started my food and agriculture law practice in New York City. And yes, I realize there are no cows in Manhattan. I'm asked that question quite a bit. So initially, uh, when I moved back from Wyoming to start my law practice, I set up shop in my little studio apartment on the Upper East Side. Um, and very quickly, I decided to get a virtual law office downtown by Wall Street, very nearby where we are right now, in fact. Um, I did that primarily from a safety standpoint. At the time, I was doing some per diem court appearances, um, even in criminal court. I just wanted to have a, an address that was separate than the place that I lived. I thought that it also, from a professional standpoint, and the fact that I wanted to, to move to another apartment, I wanted that consistency. So I chose to, ha to start off using a virtual office. Um, one of the first things I did from a marketing standpoint was to get a, get a website. I think that this is a must-have um, in this day and age. Your name of your practice, your domain name, email, et cetera. It's your online brochure. You need to have it. If you are using a virtual law office, like what I did when I first started, think about if there are any special ethical concerns in the state that you are licensed in. For example, I'm bar licensed in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And uh, at the time, New Jersey had a special requirement that if you had a virtual law office, 
your letterhead needed to say by appointment only. And I don't know if you can see this on the, on the screen, but there right by my address, there's a little asterisk that says by appointment only. And I had to disclose to my clients where my bona fide uh, law office was, which is where I lived. Um, New Jersey has since changed these rules, but um, that's just a word of caution for those of you that are uh, wanting to use virtual um, law offices. Uh, when I first started, I, just, I formed a professional limited liability company straight out of the gate. In hindsight, I didn't need to do this. When I started my practice, I didn't have a lot of assets uh, to protect. Um, I think that this is something that I think a lot of um, even attorneys misguide clients in thinking that when they start a business that they definitely need to form an LLC uh, immediately. And I don't think that that's true. It's you know, costly to form a, a limited liability company in New York. My publication requirement alone was about $1,400. Um, that said, I'm glad that I did it, um, and I did it early. I just didn't need to do that step immediately. After forming my PLLC, the next thing I did was I went to the bank, and I got a federal employer identification number. For those of you that are thinking about starting your own law practice and not forming an LLC, I still recommend getting a federal employer identification number um, in case a W-9 is sent your way. It's just better to use an FEIN as opposed to your social security number. I got an operating account and an IOLTA trust account and uh, got my business credit card. Um, after my bank and business entity was in order, I needed malpractice insurance. I, I didn't overthink this step. I basically just took the recommendation from the New York State Bar Association. Um, I used my best guesstimate on practice areas. I was conservative on higher risk areas such as environmental law, oil and gas, mineral rights, hazardous materials, IP and real estate. I needed a backup lawyer, and still today I have that backup lawyer that has keys and all my passwords. So if something was going to happen to me, if I was in the hospital, he could come in and, um, and help uh, me with uh, my, my caseload. So this, was, this is my practice when I first started out, uh, just here in my office. Um, didn't have any fancy equipment at the time. And in hindsight, what I, the, what I wish I wouldn't have tried to save money on was I would have invested early on in an accounting program. I didn't do this until later on in my practice, and it was a, became a little bit of an administrative headache. So I now have an office, a brick and mortar office of 44th and 5th Avenue. I am still a solo practitioner. I hire contract lawyers and secretaries. Um, as, on an as-needed basis, but I don't have any full-time employees right now. I've also developed a mediation niche, for example, on um, the roster of mediators for the New York State Agriculture Mediation Program. Right, how do you get these food and agriculture clients? A couple big points I'm going to talk on, branding, networking, advertising uh, versus marketing. So what is a brand? I feel like ever since I've been in business for myself, I keep hearing the word brand. Your name is your brand. You are your brand. And um, so I, I, I Googled this question because I was curious on what the actual definition was. So according to entrepreneur.com, a brand it tells your customers what they can expect from your products and services. Um, it dif differentiates you from your competitors. It's derived from who you are, um, who you want to be, um, and uh, who people perceive you to be. I actually posted this question on Facebook, and one of my friends who uh, went to a branding um, seminar, I don't know if you can see it because the print is a little small, but she said, um, a brand is the outwardly facing voice and personality of a business in a nutshell. And she goes on to talk about the components of a brand um, are the brand voice, brand vision, brand personality, and brand mission, which work together. But I liked her, how she commented here about that. It's the outwardly facing voice, and I think that, that's, that really kind of sums it up. 
So it's everything that you do, your website, your business cards, your letterhead, how you present yourself publicly, the articles you write and where you publish those articles, speeches you give, um, emails and that you write, um, how you are on Twitter and Facebook, how you present yourself at networking organizations. I'm always shocked when um, fellow professionals join networking organizations and joining them for business and to see that sometimes they're just not acting professionally. Um, so be cognizant of you know, how you present yourself in different aspects of your life. Your brand is who you are um, in everything that you do. So I never really thought about my brand, but uh, you know, I want others around me to trust my work as a food and agriculture lawyer. What does that mean? I want to show them that I have an attention to detail, that I, I'm also trying to highlight my background in growing up in production agriculture. I know a lot of very successful food and agriculture lawyers that did not grow up in production agriculture. This is not a requisite, but if you have it, flaunt it. Um, the farmers, ranchers, and agribusiness owners will want to, to feel that you understand their business. Uh, highlight any legal education that you have in food and agriculture law. Um, I, I try to present myself as a person with uh, morals and values, someone with character, um, that my understanding of the legal issues that affects the food and agriculture industry, which is quite diverse and very different than any other kind of industry. Uh, my professional reputation and also my work ethic. We're going to go through this survey results here in just a few minutes, but you know, ultimately, people decide to do business with who they know and who they like. And um, you know, it takes time for people to get to know you. And I've done a lot of just good old-fashioned networking over the last four years since I've started my law practice. I've attended a lot, a lot of food and agriculture law conference and you know the quote the world is run by those who show up and sometimes you got to show up at the county fair and <laughs> um, you know let your personality show through through social media and um, let farmers ranchers agribusiness owners and food entrepreneurs uh, know that you um, care about them and their business networking is a long-term investment I think some people get a little anxious with networking. There are no instantaneous results. But over time, you will build a solid foundation for your business. Network smart. It's about quality, um, not quantity. I don't really go to speed networking events because it reminds me too much of like speed dating. But um, you know, I don't think that there's any benefit to collecting 50 to 70 business cards in a night unless you're prepared to follow up with those people and to try to build those relationships. Um, also look at networking as part of your business. Every single Friday for the last few months, I've been hosting networking lunches in Midtown. I get about four to eight people rounded up for lunch. And this morning I was having coffee at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, it's part of my business and I look at it that way. And I don't just, I don't brush it off when I'm busy, and I uh, definitely push harder with networking when things are slow, but it's consistently part of my business life. This is my story. When I first started my law practice, I joined various email listservs for lawyers such as Solisas and through the New York State Bar Association, and I joined um, professional organizations um, such as um, various trade associations. I even started an organization called uh, the New York Agri Women, which is a state affiliate of American Agri Women. And uh, I did it for a couple different reasons, but one of them was because I didn't grow up in New York. I grew up in Illinois, and I had years and years of my life growing up being connected to farmers in Illinois. And how was I going to meet these farmers in New York? And I saw that. New York Agro Women was an opportunity for me to get out and I traveled a, a lot around the state of New York um, um, meeting a lot of women involved in agriculture. 
and it was a it was a great opportunity. I also got involved in other trade organizations like the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. So I, I put myself out there. There are a couple food and agriculture law organizations that I recommend for those of you that are not already involved. First and foremost, the American Agriculture Law Association uh, I think is stupendous. There is a annual meeting coming up in, at the end of October, it'll be in Madison, Wisconsin. But there's an annual meeting um, every fall. I think it's a great way to network with fellow food and agriculture attorneys um, from coast to coast. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, I'm the chairperson of the American Bar Association General Practice Solo and Small Firm Agriculture Law Committee. That's also a nice tool. Uh, the section, ABA section on the environment, energy, and natural resources has an agriculture management committee. The ABA section of business law has an agriculture finance committee. And I've also heard that RIPTI, um, the ABA section of real property, trust, and estate law also has a nice agriculture law community. Here locally, with the New York State Bar Association, um, we have an Agriculture and Rural Issues Committee. You can oftentimes find food and agriculture law committees um, under the Environmental Law Committee with the State Bar Association. Another brief word on networking. Remember that relationships should always be mutual. Um, I find that young attorneys tend to immediately just want to be more takers than givers. And you know, even people that come and they, they want to know everything about how it is to start a food and agriculture law practice. But they probably know an accountant that I don't know that would be a great introduction for me. And so my point is, is always think about how you can help um, somebody else in the networking community. Um, you know, the giver's game mentality, which I'm a BNI member, so um, I've, I believe strongly in that. And, um, and social capital goes a long way in, in a food and agriculture law practice. A brief word on ag advertising versus marketing. Um, I don't do a lot of advertising, and I get a, a whole lot more mileage out of writing articles. But I think that advertising is something to think about. This is um, on the screen an ad that I use in some beef cattle directories um, and some, some various things like that. Um, but it's something that you should think about for your food and agriculture law practice. Get a website, it's your online brochure, think about social media. And um, a word on advertising, even though I've yet in four years to get one person call me and say, I saw your ad in this magazine or this directory. I still think that it's good to be a business sponsor um, for certain activities or to show your support um, for various agriculture um, organizations. Um, up, uh, update online directories. This is my listing on Justia. Uh, I think avo.com also has good search engine optimization as, as well. So keep these updated. I do have people find me online, um, but it's rare with food and agriculture. Um, but I still recommend going ahead and doing that. Marketing is a little bit different than advertising. There's a big complicated definition of what is marketing on the screen right now. But put simply, marketing is about who do you want your, your next client to be. And it's composed of a myriad of factors, advertising me, one of them, pricing, are you an expensive lawyer or a cheap lawyer? Uh, community develop, development, customer service, public relations, etc. So what are some different marketing things that I've done with being a food and agriculture lawyer? I write a lot of articles and I did this when I first started my practice. I even did this whenever I was working um, for the law firm in Wyoming. Um, but I write a lot of articles in food and agriculture publications and I'm thought of um, as being a, a leader. Um, in a lot of um, different different areas because of that. 
I do speaking engagements. I just started doing email marketing. So for those of you that are listening that might have gotten an email from me, um, I've sent out two. Um, I've had leadership positions in food and agriculture organizations um, in both legal and in non-legal organizations. Um, I, I take interviews whenever I can and I attend a lot of food and agriculture law conferences to, you know, to be there um, shaking hands with the farmers and the ranchers and the agribusiness owners um, in person. And I just wrote a book. I'm not trying to sell my book. I'm making a point on marketing that, you know, I'm not planning on um, making a lot of money from these book sales, but my primary motivation behind writing a book on food and agriculture law was because uh, for branding, for, for marketing, I want people to think about me when they think about I need a New York food and agriculture lawyer. There are a lot of um, opportunity now with self-publishing, you know, perhaps you want to write an ebook on you know, farm estate planning and have it available on your website. There's a lot of opportunity for publication. All right, for the remaining part of our presentation, I wanna talk about a survey that I did that was kind of fun. I was speaking in Ohio in June and I, was, uh, I did, wasn't asked to do this survey. I think I was asked um, about you know, how, how to get and retain agriculture clients. That was what I was supposed to speak on. And I thought it would be better to hear from the farmers, the agribusiness owners, and the food entrepreneurs themselves. So I sat at home and I did this survey over a long weekend. It was over three days. I published it on Facebook, Twitter, and my blog. Um, and I emailed it to select New York agriculture producers um, and cattle producers. Um, about 70 people ended up taking the survey in a three day period of time. So not huge, but I think it's enough people that gives a nice little representation of the agriculture community. Question one was, which of the following best describes your business? Agriculture production um, was the predominant answer. 45 people were involved in agriculture production, uh, which is, was about 65% of the survey participants. 17% were agribusiness uh, owners. Two people, only two people said that they were involved in the food and beverage industry and about 14% said other. In each question, I allowed people to uh, take a moment and write comments if they wanted. And after reading the comments, the other was uh, mostly not-for-profit organizations, government officials, and uh, people working for cooperative extension. My second question was, how many lawyers have you worked with over the last two years? 25% of the people who responded to the survey said that they have never hired an attorney, zero. Uh, 32, about 33% actually said that they had hired one lawyer in the last two years. About 32% had said that they had hired two to three lawyers and about 8.5% um, had said that they had hired four or more lawyers. That's a lot of lawyers. These are larger, larger businesses. All right, here's some of the comments that came my way. Of the five lawyers I used, only two knew the law better than myself. Family-owned farm that had no succession planning, what a mess. I have only needed legal services about three times. I was represented only once. All right, next question. I'm getting some good stuff here. If you needed a lawyer, which of the following search mechanisms would you most likely use? Uh, I was surprised a little bit that the number one referral, that the number one answer was ask someone I trust for a referral. 31 people, about 44% of um, the survey takers answered that. 
number two, which I thought was gonna win, was use an attorney that I already know. 29 people um, answered it that way. And then after that, we've got a, a far off third, but I think that the fact that 85% of the people that took this survey said that they would use an attorney that they know or that they would ask somebody um, that they trust for a referral is pretty powerful. Not just for food and agriculture attorneys, but for attorneys in general. Uh, I know that in my law practice, my number one referral source is other lawyers. Um, I think oftentimes farmers, agribusiness owners, and food entrepreneurs ask you know, their local lawyer about, do you know anybody who deals specifically with this, with this food or agriculture law issue? Only 5.7% said that they would ask a food or agriculture organization. I, this was significantly lower than what I anticipated because in my own law practice, I thought that, um, you know, perhaps I need to reach out more to food and agriculture organizations and, you know, see if I can build some referral relationships there. And, uh, you know, the vast majority of people involved in food and agriculture are not going to those organizations when they need a lawyer. Only two people said that they would search online to Google. One person, they said that they would use an online search directory like Justia or Avo. Two people said other. All right, here are some of the comments I thought were interesting. Uh, this person, anonymously, I don't know who any of these people are, that I met one of the lawyers I have worked with this year because he made his passion for food evident to me while shopping in my farm stand store, and the other because he and I share the same graphic designer who is also passionate about good, clean food. Um, I don't know who this is, obviously this is anonymous, but I think it really highlights the fact that if you're wanting to be a food and agriculture lawyer, sometimes you need to kind of go to the clients and have some gumption and introduce yourself whenever the opportunity presents it, uh, whether that be at a farmer's market or at the county fair. Um, here are some additional comments. Use a firm I have personally met or have heard speak. Combination, that is ask someone I trust, ask a food and agriculture organization for a referral and search Google. So maybe the number one is that you use a lawyer that you like and trust, but uh, your presence, your online presence um, also plays a role into this, maybe to a lesser extent. Other comments, ask a professional business person who has a reason to refer their clients to legal advisors. That's, a, that's really powerful. Um, and I've been thinking in my own practice that I need to do more networking in upstate New York with financial advisors and accountants and probably business lawyers um, in rural parts because I'm here in New York City. It's very hard for me to invite accountants who are up near Albany to come eat pizza with me um, on a Friday over lunch. Uh, another comment, find a lawyer that's a specialist in the matter in question. All right, the next uh, question I asked on this survey was, what is the most important factor when deciding on a lawyer? By far, the most uh, people answered, in fact, uh, 44 out of, out of 70 people said that they are looking for a lawyer that they trust to properly deal with the uh, legal issues. In number two, 19 people or 27% of the survey takers said that they would use someone who understands my food and agriculture business. I actually thought that those responses would be flip-flopped. I really thought that the food and agriculture industry would um, gravitate towards a lawyer that they felt understood them and the different legal issues that affect them. But I think that that really also plays a role in whether or not they trust that person to deal with their legal issues, which was the number one response. Only two people said that they would pick a lawyer um, that they like and they want to work with. Only one person said that um, they would choose an attorney that's near where they live, which is good for me since I'm far away from a lot of, uh, a lot of farmers and ranchers. And uh, one person said that they would pick an attorney who is affordable. 
Nobody cared if an attorney was available after business hours, um, which I think is surprising sometimes if you see my email. <laughs> Um, and I didn't ask this question, but it would be interesting to see if farmers and ranchers and agribusiness owners really cared if the attorney was in a virtual law office or if they were in a brick and mortar office. I hear some of the comments. Trust would include at least a basic understanding of animal agriculture. Reputation is another comment. The ability and competence are critical, along with the knowledge of the applicable statutes. Another survey taker said that it is a combination that is trust, someone who understands agriculture, and someone who is affordable, uh, which is an overarching concern. Whenever I was giving this presentation in Ohio, one of the lawyers said, you know, when they answered the question um, about what were the biggest factors, only one person said affordability was one of the major factors. But as you can see here with the comments, affordability is um, still very much a concern for people involved in agriculture. So pay attention to that as we move forward. Another thought, we must be able to communicate our thoughts with each other with efficiency. thought this was a nice comment. Um, all of these are very important factors. Five years ago, I would have said someone I trust um, as the most important factor. But how would I know if I could really trust someone when I initially select an attorney? After working with two different lawyers pretty frequently over the past few years, I feel like someone you like and trust is, um, is the most important factor. I think this is kind of the crux of the presentation uh, today. I asked the question, what is your primary legal need? And by far, nearly 50%, about 47.1 or 33 people that took the survey said that general business advice was their primary legal need. And in the survey itself, I enumerated um, that that meant corporate formation, contracts, leases, and trademarks. The number two answer was um, succession and um, estate planning. Ten people um, picked that, 14.2%. Only 8.5% people said litigation. Um, you know, three people commented that permits and licenses with government and entities were their primary need. Two people said land use and zoning. Only one person said environmental compliance and debt collection. And uh, 10 people marked other. And we'll look at that when we review the comments. All right. Somebody said, nearly all the options listed here, I prefer working with someone that is familiar with all um, of my legal needs, or at least has an associate in-house that is more focused on particular areas. Um, you know, a dream of mine as I grow, when I'm thinking about where I want my law practice to be in five, 10, and 15 years, is I would love to have associates who concentrate in you know, agriculture tax issues or agriculture land use and zoning issues, et cetera. But there's a lot of things that we could do um, within the food and agriculture community by working with other attorneys that have those um, per se um, specializations. Some other comments after the question of what is your primary legal need. The next generation has taken over the farming operations as somebody who um, want, needed help with succession planning. And then 1031 exchanges, fence problems with neighbors, making them aware of the right hand rule. And I'm not entirely clear on what that is, but I should probably look into it. Uh, some other comments, labor and immigration. These are pretty hot topics now um, in the uh, food and agriculture um, industry. Um, family matters water issues, someone noted all of the above. 
some other comments here. Um, somebody marked that legislation was their number one concern. I think that's probably somebody who was working with a not-for-profit um, organization. Pipeline right-of-way issues, not-for-profit not -for -profit management advice. And um, I do a little bit of this in my practice as well, but um, there will be not-for-profit food and agriculture um, organizations that will need some legal guidance from time to time. All right. I was a little surprised when I saw the results from this question, but which of the following payment methods would you prefer to use with your ag lawyer? And by far, the number one answer was flat fee. In fact, uh, over 50%, 58.5% of the people that took my survey said flat fee was the way to go. 41 people said this. Only 24% of the survey takers said the billable hour. Um, I had subscription service here, and um, to be clear for those of you who are in the room or watching online that don't know what a subscription service is, an example of this would be with maybe estate planning. Maybe you, in, you pay a certain flat fee for various um, estate documents, wills, trusts, um, et cetera. And then you might pay your estate planning attorney $100 a month. And with that $100 a month, you can um, have a couple email exchanges, maybe a phone call about your um, estate or succession planning quarterly you can have coffee or lunch with your estate planning attorney and he or she will answer whatever questions um, that you want over that lunch and then it also includes an annual review so that would be an example of a subscription service um, I did not put contingency I couldn't believe it but I'm guessing after reading the comments that the 8.5 percent of the people that marked other we're probably um, hoping that contingency was a choice. Um, I was surprised at this because as a food and agriculture attorney, uh, the vast majority of what I do is on a billable hour basis. But I think that the billable hour tends to make clients a little nervous. Um, so I probably need to think about how I can implement more flat fee structures into um, my billing structures for food and agriculture clients. Even just with, um, you know, typical transactions um, that I think that I could, you know, be profitable for me to, to, to work on a flat fee basis. So here are some of the comments. In my particular circumstance, contingency has been used. Uh, when you have been ripped off by other members of the business and just left with bills and no money, it's impossible to hire a lawyer and try to get back what's yours. Somebody who wants uh, legal help but can't afford to pay for it. Um, I thought this was an interesting comment. In my husband's estate, they bill by the hour and extensions of tax filings are killing me. It's been two years and I'm still getting $500 bills every month for one thing or another. So this is somebody who um, probably very much wishes that she just would have gotten a flat fee bid um, initially. All right, my next question. What is your biggest concern with using a food and agriculture uh, lawyer? The number one answer was that 27% um, you know, of the people that took the survey said that an attorney will add value, that he or she will overcomplicate things. And remember, the demographic of the people that took this survey, um, about 65% of them are farmers and ranchers, um, but the second big chunk is agribusiness owners. And you know, this is what they think of lawyers, is that we're, we're making things more complicated than what they need to be. And I really keep this in mind too when I'm drafting contracts. It's hard enough to get farmers and ranchers to, to put anything in writing um, officially anyway. So if I do draft a contract, I try to keep it as simplistic as possible. 23% of the people that took the survey said that an attorney 
won't fully understand my food and agriculture business. So for those of you that are in the room or listening online that want to build and grow a food and agriculture law practice, I think, you know, really try to highlight from a marketing standpoint your experience with food and agriculture. The number three answer was um, that the attorneys won't be worth the legal fees. In fact, 15 people said that, 21.4%. The number three answer was that a good lawyer will be too busy to give my food business the time and attention that I need. With only two votes, uh, a lawyer will just try to sell me more legal products that my business um, does not need. And five people marked other. And let's see what the comments say. I seem to never be 100% sure we got the issue at hand resolved properly so it won't be challenged in the future. It seems very difficult to get a straight answer from a lawyer. Many times after asking a question, I am confu more confused than before I asked a question. So I think that you know, just generally speaking, you know, I think um, a lot of attorneys you know, probably just assume that our clients you know, understand what it is that we're talking about. But I think that you know, we all need to probably do a better job of checking in to make sure um, that is clear. Another comment, the estate planner and our lawyer make decisions based on what they think my husband wants. My lawyer doesn't consult me as to what I would want. Um, and that's concerning on a couple, on a couple different levels, but um, just highlighting some of the complexities with doing farm estate planning work. Another, uh, another comment, that my case will not be properly managed and or the services provided will be inadequate. That's not good. That pe that's what people think that food and agriculture lawyers do. Another comment, it takes a special type of attorney to truly understand what a farmer deals with on a daily basis. It is too easy to forget to overlook the fact that the farm oftentimes is the farmer's home. This is a, a bit of an issue sometimes. They also need to realize that most farmers can't always just adjust their price to recover the cost of a good lawyer. So again, we've got somebody who's um, saying that legal fees are a little too high for, for us. Another comment, lawyers are untrustworthy, which is a typical view of most farmers and ranchers. And um, I don't know if uh, most farmers and ranchers think that lawyers are untrustworthy. I think that they think that, they're, that we're not worth the money, that all we are is gonna get a bunch of uh, big legal fees. And surprisingly, somebody said there are no concerns really. So thank you for that. My final question was open-ended, and it said, how can the legal community better serve you? Um, some of the responses, be more familiar with agriculture business. Uh, be available when I need a lawyer. Keep up to date on agriculture and food issues. Get out in the field and get their hands dirty. Uh, kiss, uh, keep it simple. Listen and understand. If you don't, then ask questions. And then we've got somebody here that's complaining of you know, frivolous litigation practices. Um, he or she says unwarranted motion practice should be eliminated. Another comment, I realize that a lot of farmers find fees too high. So again, we've got kind of a recurring theme here of we can't afford you, we can't afford you. Uh, have attorneys that specialize in specific aspects. We kind of heard that again in another, another comment as well. Give value and knowledge, stay current and reasonable with pricing, and try to keep it cooperative. A few more last comments. Um, he or she wants general assistance to help this person do it themselves. And I think that's a that's oftentimes what people in the agriculture community want from an attorney is, um, you know, help me file my own LLC. Um, this other person says, quit frivolous lawsuits just to get rich and to try to better understand the issues in the agriculture. 
help me learn local and state law, have more reasonable fee structures for farmers, be more open to answering my questions, learn and understand. If you don't, then ask questions. So what does this all mean for those of you in the room and online that are wanting to start and grow a food and agriculture law practice? Question one. How do you become a lawyer that is known or referred by someone who is trusted um, as a food and agriculture attorney? Question two, how do we give farmers and agribusinesses to trust us with their legal issues? Remember, that was the number one response to the question, by far, um, that attorneys hire people that they trust. How do we convince farmers and ranchers that hiring an attorney is cost effective? We add value, we are worth the expense. Um, how do we implement more flat fee billing structures in the food and agriculture law industry? Because that's what the industry is wanting. Um, if you remember, about 65% of the people that took the survey want that. The next pivotal question, how can food and agriculture lawyers have a more concerted voice among the agriculture community? Um, here's an example. I was listening to NPR and they had a, a podcast about California versus New Jersey wine. And I'm here in New York City, I've never heard of New Jersey wine before, but evidently there's quite a uh, wine industry in New Jersey. In fact, it, like they win international taste tests. And, uh, but nobody's heard of this. Um, but everybody has heard of the Napa Valley and California wine. And you know, the reason for that is because there's a concerted marketing effort that's taking place with the California vineyards, getting people to come to California and come on vacation and come do wine tasting tours. And New Jersey just isn't, doesn't have the same concerted marketing power. So my question for all of you is how can food and agriculture lawyers have more of a concerted voice um, in the agriculture industry as far as marketing goes? Um, how can food and agriculture lawyers, especially those in solo and small firms like myself, work better with one another? A couple of those answers today were we want to work with lawyers who have specialists in all of these different areas. You know, and a solo practitioner like me just can't can't do it. I don't. I can't um, be an expert in every area of law. But how can we work with one another to um, to help help our clients with that? All right, in close, what are the primary legal needs of the food and agriculture community? As the survey said, and also in my experience. I think that business law by far is the number one concern of people um, in the food and agriculture law industry. Business formations, contracts, leases, trademarks, buy-sell agreements, partnership agreements, uh, business and succession planning. But there's a cultural roadblock here and um, that is that the food and agriculture community is a handshake culture. It's a little bit of a good old boys club gentlemen's agreements. Part of the challenge is, for me, as an agriculture attorney, is trying to explain that simply because you have a contract in writing doesn't mean that you don't trust that other person. It just may sound business sense. After business law, there are a myriad of issues that affect the food and agriculture law industry. Um, and circling back to the first part of my presentation today, it's unrealistic that you're going to have a deep understanding in all of these uh, various issues. Find your niche, what works for you. Know um, a little bit about a lot and a lot about a little and build relationships with people that have a deep understanding. For example, I know enough about immigration law to be dangerous and anybody who I work with um, on an immigration issue, I'm working with another immigration attorney. And, um, and I think that, that's, that, is, that is a proper way to do it. 
who do you need to build relationships with? Maybe that's employment lawyers, real estate lawyers, um, somebody who understands crop insurance disputes, trust and estates lawyers, bankruptcy lawyers, etc. If you have more questions on how to grow and build a food and agriculture law practice, every on the first Friday of the month at two o'clock Eastern time, I have a Skype um, presentation. Up to 10 people can Skype at the same time. And uh, it's free of charge. You know, if you want to RSVP, please um, email me at carrie at rinkerlaw.com. And please uh, stay in touch. I have all the different ways that you can get in touch with me, including uh, you can tweet me as well. So please find me on Facebook and Twitter and, um, and let me know, you know how we can possibly work together to help the food and agriculture uh, law industry. Appreciate your time today. Thank you.